Cuba because Castro is still in power. And I wouldn't go to a place, I was born there, so I have a moral commitment to the country. So meanwhile, it's not a democratic country, I will never go. As many other artists have done. There's the case of Picasso and Casals, they never went to Spain, meanwhile Franco was there. So meanwhile, Castro is there and we have not a democratic country. I wouldn't dare, I mean, morally speaking, I couldn't go to a place where human rights are violated every day. And democracy doesn't exist. art made by Cubans uh, and within that there are a number of characteristics uh, commonalities and divergencies in style that sort of fits within a very loose category of art made by Cubans Cuban art as Latin American art is are terms that are used for practical purposes it's more convenient to talk in general about Cuban art instead of going all the way talking about art made by Cuban artists. The same applies with Latin American art. You know, you have the, the official history in the art history books, which is sort of like the party line. And of course, they leave out everybody who is an artist of color or a woman. And if you read those books, you say, oh, this is it. There's no other histories. Uh, these artists have given a great deal uh, to Western tradition. Uh, I think in the 20th century, uh, Cuban artists, like other Latin American artists, have maintained traditions that have been lost, particularly in European and North American art. And they have, as a whole, been committed to a figural uh, expressionist uh, sensibility that, you know, with the so-called death of art in the late 60s, uh, has been pretty much ignored by the professional art critics. Cuba has produced world-class artists and the artists that I think right now I would put in the in that list of, uh, of very great figures are Lam, are, uh, is uh, Amelia Pelaez and then when we do have artists like Carreño and um, Carlos Enriquez who I think are, are contenders and there I'm speaking of the older uh, generation, but certainly uh, Agustin Fernandez is a world-class artist. The critics have uh, defined him as a kind of proto-surrealist, uh, and maybe there's some of that. He is one of the few artists of his generation who has an incredible sense of craftsmanship. He knows how to paint. He knows how to draw. I think I always wanted to be a painter since I was very young. I don't remember when I started painting. I do remember two drawings that I have in my photo album, an apple and the theater. And also I remember a painting I did of a palm tree with my grandmother's colors. She was a painter, was her hobby, was not a painter, was her hobby. And I did the painting with her th palette many years ago. Well, San Alejandro was an academy, so first I had to study in the afternoon from six o'clock to 11. And this was very good because I could stay out of my home after 11 o'clock. So I used to go to school until 11, and from 11 to 1 o'clock, I wandered Havana. That's an op opportunity I never had before. They used to teach you how to paint. I mean, this, I think, was very important, how to draw. So we draw from natural with models. Also was important. I was very young, and we, I was faced with two nakedness for the first time, men and women. And uh, drawing was important at that time and nowadays, because I mean, that's the structure of all the paintings. I mean, whatever you do, you need a structure. And I think basically the drawing is the structure of the painting. In 1949 and 1950, 
I was at the Art Student League during the summer. I spent three months each summer, and I went to classes with uh, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, the Japanese American uh, painter, and with George Grossi, American, uh, the German American painter. Yasuo Kuniyoshi was more an influence in my life than the other, than George Gross, because I studied with him, and he took me. Uh, he he had great sympathy for me, so I worked with him a lot, and he changed my technique a lot. Uh, as I came from Havana, I was using the academic technique, you know, that's quite different from what he thought. So he said I was wrong absolutely what I did, so I started painting from light to dark. Usually you paint from dark to light in, uh, in academy. So this was a great change in uh, technically speaking. And also he put me in contact with many ideas that I didn't have before. He changed my whole idea of drawing, too. So that's, uh, before I used to draw very from nature, trying to copy exactly what I saw. With Yasu Koniyoshi, I started thinking that nature was very different from what it was, what I saw. I didn't draw what I see. That's a great change. He used to say that drawing was like clapping. You clap with two hands, just try to clap with one hand. So I tried to clap with one hand. That was my drawing. Yes, I did support Castro and the Cuban Revolution. Not especially Castro Revolution. We were against Batista, the whole country. So I was part of a movement called the Resistencia, the, the resist, uh, civic resistance. So I was much against, and I got a scholarship from the new government, from Castro. That's the reason 59 was important. Not only Batista felt that I left Cuba, I went to Paris. The revolutionary government gave like 32 or 30 scholarships for artists, and I was one of those. And some they came to this country, some they went to Europe, some they went to Spain, some they went to Paris, and I went to Paris. I go to Paris, where I stay for 10 years. Just for one year with the scholarship, because it was cut, you know, they didn't have any funds. So, well, it lasted for a year. It was supposed to be two years. And then we were supposed to go back to Cuba. But I didn't go back to Cuba because uh, since the beginning we realized that the Cuban government was not a socialist government as we thought it was a communist government. So I stayed in Paris. That's the reason I then went back to Cuba. Agustin is probably uh, the exception to the rule that we have been contemplated with other artists, other Cuban artists about the light. Um, that happened at the, at the beginning, before he left Cuba. He had these bright, beautifully colored paintings. When he left for Paris, he became more intellectual, more introspective. Uh, his paintings are talk more about personal uh, expressions of tensions that exist in the world or that exist in his world. The first stage of my work was rather figurative. I have figures and I think it was very personal. It has no influence of anyone. And the second stage that came like two years after was more influenced by uh, the French Impressionists, like Bonnard. I mean, I use a lot of colors, and also, in a little way, was influenced by the American school of, uh, uh, how you call it, the uh, action painting, because I use very freely color. In fact, I saw James Johnson Sweeney in the 50s, and he was amazed at the way I used color, because it was very wild, a sort of a fov artist. And this, I, I last doing this color for um, like six or seven years until 59 that I start having a grayer palette. So this was like seven years of, of color, very strong color. And very, and heavier in pasto. Nowadays I paint, my paint is not so heavy as at that moment. I used to paint with the small brush strokes and with heavy color. Nowadays I use big strokes and very little color. I do what the Italians say call a media pasta. I mean, it's uh, not a heavy, amount of painting ever. So this is a great change. Technically, it's a great change. I don't know to the eye if it's so great. 
he became prominent uh, in Cuba in the 50s with very, very lush uh, still lifes and landscapes. Very tropical looking, but abstract. Certainly not uh, uh, things that, that look like anything we might recognize, if, of course, based on, on reality, but very abstract and you know, a great deal of fantasy. I did many still lives. First, uh, the first reason was because, I mean, still lives is, a, is still. So it gave me the opportunity to study what I saw very clearly and very patiently. It's not like a human body, not like a landscape. And also it's a, a very... Um, recurrent or uh, theme in painting. I mean, since the classics, they have been doing uh, still lives to modern days. So you have a big spectrum of still lives where you can study. So I think it's ideal if you're a studious. And this was my case. I want to study everything about color and about composition. So I have the idea that still life gave me the opportunity. I was never an abstract, absolutely abstract painter. So I need, you know, something to anchor me to reality. So I think I chose well. His, his work is just beautiful, from the early work, which I was privileged to see, to the work that he's doing he, now. It's very powerful. After he left Cuba in 1960, he really abandoned color in general, from uh, turn to beige and black and white, and uh, very severe color combinations. And it, again, like Estopin Young, there's a lot of angst and a lot of uh, I think anger uh, in the work after, after he, uh, he went into exile. I arrived with my wife at that moment, Leah, and uh, first we went to a very bad hotel, and we didn't like it. She cried the whole night. She was very depressed until we moved to a better hotel. It was the first uh, Rue Batignol. It was an ugly hotel, cheap hotel in the, what they call the, uh, the Red uh, Belt of Paris that was recommended to me by a friend in Cuba, belonging, of course, to the Communist Party, and was very depressing. The, the arrival was depressing, and then later on, we got used to it. Mata, in the beginning, when I arrived to Paris, he gave me some advices. How should I paint? I mean, he said I should simplify, because I gave a lot in each painting. And that's a very strange advice coming from him, because he gives too much always. But anyway, I follow the advice, and also it was Enrique Sañartu who said that my color was too bright. So these two opinions, and seeing all the things, and I suppose a change, I did change a lot in the beginning, the first year. I changed in the sense that it, from a painting, I took part of it, and I enlarged it, like, let's say, like in a photo, when you do a blow up of the photo. That's what I did. I took the more important part and I work on it and then I subdue the color. Instead of having it very bright colors, I put some gray and some beige. And this, in this way began the, like, a sort of a gray beige period with a lot of burnt umber and sienna, so colors that I didn't use so much before. But this has to do also a lot to do with the city. Paris is a very great city. And the change from, you know, from Cuba, New York to Paris, great. It's a very big change. New York influenced me very much. I mean, the, the, the black paintings, they would have never been able, I would have never been able to do them out of New York. I mean, I don't know if it's the city or the way we live here, or what happened, or it's my age. But I mean, this, if I was never in New York, I would have never done, you know, the very heavy black paintings, the big ones. That's so. I think it's the whole uh, concept of the city. Because any way you paint what you see, I mean, you're, if you're surrounded by something, basically you end by painting it. So I think I have been painting New York without knowing it. I'm the only painter who has painted New York all the time. I'm an abstract painter, basically, that makes some human forms with what I do. The whole idea is an abstraction because I, my aspiration would be to be a metaphysical painter. So, and uh, I have some themes that they come from surrealism and some that they come from the hard edge. So I'm a mixture of the two of those things that are very opposite. So it's very difficult to follow what I'm trying to say, but I mean, to follow an image, it's difficult too. So this, uh, you must forgive me because it's 
it's rather tough, no? And of course, I have a lot of to do with South American art without knowing it, because I use uh, that element of nature. Let's say American art has eliminated more or less the big painters, Pollock or Klein, the human figure, absolutely. And in Latin America, we haven't been able to get rid of it. Because even the big painters, like Wilfredo Lam, like Rivera, like uh, Mata, you always have something of human figure. It's like a fight between uh, figure and, and landscape, I would say. American painting is just landscape. So in a way, I belong to this part of uh, Latin America or European also. And as you see, I haven't explained anything. But I have given you certain clues to what I do. And of course, I'm very strongly influenced by many of the painters of the Baroque. I mean, the way they do paint, because I'm a moral, I have a great structure in my work. I mean, I don't work easily. I'm not informal. I'm a very formal painter who has a technique, who has a structure, and fill those spaces with something very concrete. So it's not standing in front of the canvas and just or smashing the canvas or throwing the painting. It's a whole idea, it's a different idea, it's a very guided idea. And basically I think all the painters they try to communicate with the, with the viewer because that's the main thing of painting. If you don't communicate it's nothing what you have done. So basically I try to communicate something, a type of idea, not verbal, that I have to the viewer. That's, uh, I would say that's, a, that's an explanation. My art was supposed to be very erotic in the 60s because, I mean, no one did erotic work. So in the 60s, it was supposed to be erotic. Then in the 70s, as everyone did erotic, mine was not erotic at all. So that's, uh, I, would, I would say that was the, I mean, it's a very difficult question to answer. First, I mean, it's the approach to, of people to the art, I mean, to what I do. So in the 60s, it was considered more erotic than nowadays. Nowadays, I'm not considered an erotic artist. And in the beginning, yes. I mean, things have changed a lot. So many things that we see nowadays, we have never seen, let's say, 20 years ago, 30 years, we're talking 30 years ago. So that's the change. The whole change is not my work, it's the approach of the public. Yeah, he, he, he will deny that, but I think it's quite obvious when you see these, these uh, breasts and, uh, and penis-like forms and, that are twisting and turned into snakes, that there is a very strong erotic component. In fact, I think it's, it's the, one of the keys to his art. I never consider myself an erotic artist. I mean, this was part of the work. I'm more a metaphysical artist, I mean, in a way. Like Morandi, I mean, that type of, uh, at least that's what I would like to be. I disagree with him in saying that his art is spiritual. I think his art is profoundly erotic uh, and with very serious overtones of s &M. But it's a work that, he's an artist that has pushed beyond the borders uh, of his work. He's constantly growing. I met Robert Mapplethorpe through a friend of ours that, was, uh, that knew him. And he wanted to have a show of Robert Mapplethorpe, me, um, Nancy Grossman, and I think Lee Bontegu. I don't remember who was the fourth artist. So I went to see Robert with this man who was organizing the show with my wife, and we became friends immediately. I don't know the reason. I mean, Robert was very sociable and very friendly. This is a new version of Robert, but anyway, that uh, was uh, our experience. So since we met him, he just called us a week after and we became friends. And the show, of course, was never done. I mean, he, this man thought that we had a lot in common in a certain way, because, I mean, he's a very direct, uh, Robert was a photographer first, and he's a very direct photographer. All the opposite of what I am. I'm a painter, but I mean, I'm not direct. I mean, I don't paint images that you see exactly what they are. So in a way, it's the opposite, though. Maybe this was the reason we became friends, because we have no conflict. I think that they had a common sensibility, uh, portraying 
and studying uh, eroticism, uh, but not in a really in, a, in, in an objective way. Uh, people have always have thought, well, Maplethorpe and uh, and sometimes Fernandez, how offensive this this art is, so offensive. They're tr they're just trying to shock. And they've, neither of them ever tried to shock anyone. They were just portraying, as I said earlier, uh, realities that are painfully um, apparent in, uh, in, in human history and culture and in human relations. I think we, uh, Robert and Maplethorpe and I, what we have in common was a very peculiar eye that saw things that are not so usually seen. And we have like a sort of research of all certain bizarre reality and a choice of colors and materials I would say that was the the, the main uh, connection between the two works. Well Robert Maplethorpe took some photos of my son the youngest Sebastian. He took one with a friend of Sebastian, and it's a very nice photo, very well known, that Sebastian is standing and the other boy is like uh, seemingly slapping him. That's a well known. And then he took two, three more of Sebastian, and they're not erotic at all. I mean, the photos are, the child looks like a statue. And they're very pure and very, really wonderful photos. And then he took one of myself. And I think he, he caught my real self. And then when he spent uh, in San Juan with us uh, part of the summer, he always wanted to take a photo of my mother. She was still alive, she died. And she was very sick at that time. And one day she was in the garden, and Robert saw her and said, I'm going to take her now. And he took the photo that I have, I still I have the photo. So in a way we have the whole, most of the family, I have one of my children, me and my mother. Those, those uh, and some other photos that he gave me as a present. He gave me as a present the photo. Uh, he gave it to Leah more than to me. The photo in his book with the cigarette. He's having a like, red, uh, like a leather jacket. He's smoking. And I remember that Leah said to him that he didn't look like that. He looked very coarse in the photo. And Robert said, "I see myself like that." As you see, we have a different image of ourselves. So, you know, losing a friend is not easy, and especially when he died in the way he died, he died of AIDS. And he suffered a lot. He was very courageous when he was sick. So we used to see him like once a week, Sundays, I mean, we went to visit. And he was dying slowly, but surely. So in a way, you're never the same when you have a very good friend who dies in this way. That's uh, an experience that I don't wish on anyone. And of course, I mean, Robert, having such a great personality, being such a good artist, we miss him a lot. I would like to simplify a little bit what I'm doing, because usually I go from very complicated to very simple, and I go through periods, no? In color had happened, also in design. In this moment, I think I'm doing excessive things, so I would like to clean a little bit the work and make it more tight. And I might do, I'm doing a series of uh, foam rubber objects or, or sculptures or whatever you want to call them. It's wonderful. It's, again, it's coming out of a very old, old at this point, uh, Dada and Surrealist tradition of found objects, transformation of found objects, which we see in the works of, uh, of Duchamp, of Cornell, of many, of uh, certainly Man Ray. And it's marvelous because he will walk around the streets of the village, for instance, finding uh, old light bulbs, finding foam, finding the discards of our society, finding the junk, and turning it into high art. I have lived in exile 34 years, and I left Cuba when I was 32. It changed the whole thing. I mean, I'm not the same person if I would have stayed in Cuba. I don't know if I should be grateful to Castro, even if I'm anti-Castro, the fact that I have been out and I've been in exile. But the whole approach of everything changes when you're going to go back home. I think I miss 
a mood of Cuban life, but I don't think it's coming back, whatever happened. Maybe it's the mood of uh, an old time, no? Gone. Maybe I miss my own youth, or maybe I miss the country. And all those, or you know, the dear people we have lost, I mean, in, this, uh, in the way. Because many of them are gone, my mother, and my parents, my, my friends. Well, I suppose this is a very human thing to everyone, even if you move from where you live. I mean, but in a way, mostly I, I miss the mood. And the type of life is not coming back again. You see, each painter belongs to a group. And um, basically, those groups belong to a nation. And in the case of Cuba, this was broken. Uh, let's say the mystical uh, body of the Cuban painting was broken in two parts. One stayed in Cuba, and one went out of the people who has my age. Of course, the new generation, they don't belong to any of this thing we're talking. I mean, if you're Cuban, you're painting nowadays in the States or wherever you are. If you're less, if you're 40, let's say, you don't belong to anything being Cuban, whatever they think they are. But in our case, I mean, we were absolutely, it's like a divorce. I mean, everything, they stay, or friends, they stay in Cuba and they change of party. I mean, let's say Mariano Rodrigo was a great friend of mine. He became, he was always a communist but he became very anti-Castro. We never say hello to each other again. I mean, we were separate. And also, aesthetically speaking, it's difficult because, I mean, uh, we belong to the same group of school. Even if we don't look alike, I mean, there's something missing that you have to substitute. And in my case, I think I have substituted in a very able way, but it has been very difficult because I, have, I don't have no roots at all. I'm a painter who works in the end of vacuum, basically, because I don't belong to Cuba, I don't belong to the School of Paris, I don't belong to New York, I mean, where I belong to. This question, I would like someone to answer me, where I belong. <laughs>